Well, folks, we are three months into this six-month trip through the Appalachian Mountains. It's halfway over, and I'm falling deeper in love with its plants and animals every single day. Here's what I saw and learned this month in the central Appalachian region of Pennsylvania, western Maryland, and the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. This month, our home base was Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, which is a small town that's nestled in the valley between the northernmost end of the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Ridge and Valley Province. I'm starting to see that my observations each month have had a very clear theme. In North Carolina in April, I saw an abundance of spring ephemeral wildflowers. While in Virginia for the month of May, I got to meet a whole slew of adorable salamanders. And this month in Pennsylvania and surrounding areas, slime molds were the subject that caught my eye above all else. Now, before any Pennsylvanians take this as an insult, hear me out. Slime molds are beautifully bizarre, and while they might look like fungi, they're actually in the kingdom protozoa. They're shapeshifters, and they can totally transform their color, shape, and texture in a matter of just a couple of days. This month, while hiking through Michaud, Rothrock, and Tuscarora State Forests and beyond, I encountered an entire rainbow of slime molds. I mostly found them growing on decaying logs, especially abundant after a good rain. I found salmon egg slime mold in Bear Meadows natural area with its funky bright orange pin-like structure. I found chocolate tube slime many times, identifiable by its long strands of brown gooey weirdness. On a weekend trip to Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, I found some gorgeous red raspberry slime. A great one for beginner mold hunters is called dog vomit slime. It's an unfortunate name, but it's easy to spot because it's very plentiful and its bright yellow color is clearly visible even from far away. After each adventure into the woods, I come home and write down everything that I saw and experienced on that hike so that I don't forget anything. I go through all my photos and identify and read about any plants or animals that were new to me that day. So I currently have a running log of 52 hikes that I've taken since April 1st, with detailed accounts of the location, time of day, and what I saw. This helps me keep everything straight throughout my book writing process. Midway through this month, I visited the Ned Smith Center for Nature and Art, which is a museum, gallery, and outdoor education school created in honor of one of the most celebrated and prolific wildlife illustrators of the 20th century, the late Ned Smith. I got to tour the archives, which house thousands of Ned's inspiring original paintings and field sketches, and I got to take a walk around the center's trail system with one of Ned's close friends, Jerry. Jerry is a retired wildlife biologist who has been walking these woods regularly for 30 years. As a young man, he traveled all over the world for his work as a biologist, and even worked as a park ranger in places like Denali and the Everglades. Jerry and I did some nature snooping, which is a phrase of his that I love and will probably use to describe what I do from now on. Together, we sat quietly by a swamp and observed a delicate fawn who was hidden on an island, investigated logs for fungi, and found a teeny weeny frog that still had part of its tail attached. Jerry knows this land so intimately that he could point out a specific log from afar and tell me with confidence that I will definitely find some orange eyelash cup fungi on it. And he was right. Part of me is eager to root myself in one place so that I can spend years getting to know one small patch of land on such a deep personal level. But it's helpful to know that Jerry also had a traveler's heart for a long while, moving around to explore unfamiliar and faraway landscapes. Right now, it's my time to roam, and I'm so thankful for it. But I do look forward to the day when I can know and read my home's natural surroundings in the way that Jerry can. It's also just comforting to remember that our curiosity doesn't have to fade as we get older. Last week, I spent four days at Shavers Creek, Penn State's Environmental Center. There I got to observe the bird banding process of baby kestrels, and I even got to hold one of them as the team took blood samples, weighed them, and attached tiny metal bands displaying a unique number on each one so that researchers can track the local kestrel population. I noticed that although she felt totally weightless in my hands, the little 20-day-old kestrel's heartbeat was strong and steady. I also met up with a group of local nature journalers at the Black Mishannon State Park bog, where we spent the morning delighting in and sketching carnivorous bog plants. This leg of the trip has been just as rich and wonderful as the first two. Now we're packing up and getting ready to head further north on Friday. 
Thanks for following along.